Welcome to Lecture Night at the David Dunlap Observatory online with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Toronto Centre. My name is Denise Chilton and I am the RASC Toronto Centre DDO Committee Chair and an operator of the 74-inch telescope at the David Dunlap Observatory. I am delighted to be your host for tonight's lecture. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's mission is to enhance understanding of and inspire curiosity about the universe through public outreach, education, and support for astronomical research. In partnership with the City of Richmond Hill, RASC hosts outreach activities at the David Dunlap Observatory, or DDO. The observatory is home to Canada's largest optical telescope. While we miss working from the DDO, we are happy to bring you the lecture nights we had planned for the summer through this webcast instead. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight's lecture, Dr. John Morris. Dr. Morris is the York Research Chair in Space Exploration at York University. Despite frustrations with a tiny department store telescope in his youth, John chose to pursue a bachelor's degree in engineering science, aerospace from the University of Toronto, and later a PhD in planetary science from the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Liber Laboratory. He is a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists, as well as a participating scientist on the Mars Science Laboratory, MSL mission, popularly known as the Curiosity Rover. After training on MER, the Spirit and Opportunity Rovers in 2004, he contributed to the 2005 Huygens mission to Saturn's moon Titan and the 2008 Phoenix mission to the Martian Arctic. Dr. Morris is the Director of Technologies for Exoplanetary Science and CERC CREATE program, a member of the Canadian Space Agency's Planetary Exploration Consultation Committee, and the Canadian Meteorologic, Meteorological and Oceanographic Society's Scientific Committee, and is the Associate Dean of Research for the Lausanne School of Engineering. Tonight, Morris will explore the history of investigating Martian methane in his talk, Methane on Mars, Fact, Folly, or Figment. If you, our viewers, have questions for Dr. Morris, please ask them in the YouTube chat. He will have some time to answer questions at the end of his talk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Morris. Thank you very much, Denise, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's a lovely day here in Toronto. I would love to be up at the DDO myself. It looks like you're gonna have a good night, but unfortunately um, we can't go there. So I just wanna thank you for you know, giving me the opportunity to speak with you uh, here in, in this forum instead. So tonight, what I want to share with you is uh, a real scientific debate that has been absolutely burning up the uh, community in the last couple of years. And we keep finding out new and wonderful pieces of information in this debate, which is just so fascinating. And now this idea of, you know, methane on Mars and, and what does it mean? We now see weird things happening with other molecules in the Martian atmosphere, like oxygen. And of course, those two are combustible together. So hence the little bit of fire that I have. But this uh, real debate here, there are many different sides to it. And you've got people who think that methane is a proven fact some who think it's a folly and some who think that it's a complete figment. So let me walk you through this. But before we uh, jump right into methane, let's uh, take a moment and talk about why it is planetary atmospheres are important in the first place. Well, the reason for this is that an atmosphere is the most easily probed part of a planet. That's where we can find information most easily. This is why we have space telescopes that are really interested in looking at the atmospheres of other planets, even those outside of our own solar system. And in fact, we've been able on places like Mars to map very, very small concentrations of gases. And we also get the opportunity to look at very, very far away things as well, looking for those telltale signs uh, in the atmosphere. You know, is there something interesting that's going on there? What I'm showing here, we've got the, uh, the TESS spacecraft, which is not looking at atmospheres directly, but it's trying to find uh, out whether there are planets around the nearest and brightest stars uh, to the Earth. And so these are the places we'll follow up with atmospheric investigations. And what does that kind of a transit of a planet with an atmosphere look like close up? 
We've got lovely images from the International Space Station. You can see down here that just light up that atmosphere with, uh, with photons. And we can take a look and see what it's made of by looking at the colors that get transmitted through the atmosphere. So the other side of planetary atmospheres is the idea that the planetary atmosphere encodes the history of the planet. By knowing what it's made up of, you know what that planet has been through, where it's been, what's happened on it, all of these different processes. We can learn about things like volcanic outgas, whether it has a carbon cycle, how materials escape from the top of the atmosphere, and whether or not maybe there's life in that place. So we can look at uh, gases that are out of place, things like methane, for instance. And uh, you can get a lovely view of what this looks like um, if you take a look at the sort of, you know, backside of Pluto, which I have here. So you can see this lovely blue ring that goes around the planet. That's the atmosphere. The sun is in front of the planet from the perspective of New Horizons here. And it's the existence of that atmosphere that allows for some of the more interesting planetary processes to even occur. The reason we have such an interesting geology on Pluto, and you can see it up here with these, you know, icy mountains and all of this, uh, you know, interesting bubbling nitrogen. Uh, this only is able to exist. It's not just an evaporating scoured world because of the existence of that atmosphere. Let me give you another example. If we go a little closer to home, we go to Mars here, we can take a look at an image like this. This is from the Spirit Rover at the Columbia Hills. And what we see today is this sort of, you know, dusty scape um, out before us. In these hills, the uh, rover actually found some evidence of conditions in the past. And I bet you what I can do with this, I can, uh, you know, make one simple change that makes it seem a lot more habitable, a lot more, you know, welcoming. So take a look at, you know, focus your eyes on this section in the red box and maybe on this cleft rock here. I'll add one thing to this scene which will uh, really change the way that you look at this sort of lifeless arid plain. Just add a little bit of water to it. So in Mars of the past, we had a habitable environment and that was enabled by a very thick atmosphere. Without that thick atmosphere, you just can't have liquid water sitting on the planet's surface in quite this way. Now, I imagine I can show you another scene where you don't even have to imagine the water. I don't even have to add it. So if we go to uh, the Gale Crater landing site of the Curiosity rover, what you'll see here are all of these rocks lined up back and forth in all of these sort of concentric circles. And what these are is the ancient shorelines of a lake that once filled this crater. And I don't even have to add the water, I don't think, for you to be able to imagine what that lake might have looked like. So this tells us a little bit of the interplay of atmospheres with conditions on the surface, how they can tell us something about what happened in the past. And I wonder if maybe we can learn something about what's going on underneath the surface if we start looking at things like trace gases, things that are there in very minute quantities, things like methane. So let's start with methane. And let's start with the facts. So what do we know about methane on Mars? What's sort of the present situation? How have we built up this, this knowledge and understanding? So, and, and why do we care even? Why do we have all of this, this fuss about methane? Well, the reason is that on the Earth, methane in the atmosphere, it's something that's maintained by life. We have present life that uh, emits the stuff into the atmosphere. Uh, one famous example is critters like this. Here we have a cow. Um, in its digestive tract, it breaks down the grass that it eats, and one of the gases that uh, come out is methane. You also get uh, decomposing long dead organic matter, so basically stuff that's been buried beneath the surface, and that gets chemically changed and emits methane as well. And so oil reserves often are full of natural gas, which is methane. And so you can see down here the methane being burned off because often it's something that's undesirable. Uh, entertainingly, um, some people will confuse these two sources of methane a little bit, maybe in this sort of a, a way. But the main point here is that this is material that doesn't stick around forever. There are other organisms that consume the methane. We have bacteria in the soil that do that. And 
primarily, we have photons from the sun that break that methane apart over time into water and carbon dioxide. So that's something that we know can happen on Mars as well, because the sun's in the Martian sky. It also causes these same chemical reactions to, uh, to take place. So what that means is that if there is methane on Mars, it has to be something that is produced in the present day. So I'm not saying there's cows under the surface of Mars emitting methane that then comes up for us to see in the atmosphere, but there's got to be something going on for us to see this in the atmosphere today. So here's what a plume of methane looks like on Mars. This is a, a, essentially a plot, an image, if you will, that was prepared by a, a group, the Goddard Space Flight Center, led by Mike Mulla. And what you're seeing here is the globe of Mars with uh, that emission of methane. The red areas are where the methane is high, the blue areas where it's a little bit lower, and the uncolored areas are places where uh, either the telescope couldn't see or there was nothing that was detectable. The places where the methane is high in this image are really interesting. There's a place called Milifosse, which is right over that reddish area, and that's where you have the, the big peak. It's small compared to the Earth, but it's big for Mars at 45 parts per billion by volume, hence the PPBV. What makes Nilifase a really interesting place is that it's a place on the surface of Mars where there's all of these cracks and all of these pathways sort of into the subsurface. So if you had methane under the subsurface being produced in the current day, this is a place where it could get out. We also see a lot of rocks here like carbonates, for instance, that point to an ancient environment that must have had some uh, water in it. So this is a really interesting place. Um, MoMA made his discovery using the IRTF telescope in Hawaii. So it was a detection that was made not by a spacecraft at Mars, but from right here on the Earth. And essentially the amount of material that he sees is 19,000 tons. It's a fair bit of, of methane. And what was really interesting about this and very surprising was that when he looked again, because he's astounded to make the discovery, when he looks again four months later, it all seems to be gone. So that caused a little bit of head scratching, but just seeing it at all, this type of gas, it caused an absolute sensation when it was first announced back in 2003. So that got people to thinking, where is it that this methane could be coming from? And there's a couple of dis different sources. So the most exciting ones, would be the microbes down here. Maybe we've got microbes in the subsurface, maybe Mars is habitable on the subsurface, and they create the methane that then gets outgassed in the atmosphere. Maybe it spends some time locked in water in something called clathrates, maybe it goes directly up. There's another possibility, you don't need life to do this. You can also have very common planetary rocks, olivine for instance, when that mixes with hot water, you can get methane released through uh, the process called serpentinization, which creates the mineral asbestos that we're all familiar with um, as a fire retardant. So once it gets into the atmosphere, you can eventually have this stuff moved around. There's uh, chemistry from the sun, all of those photons. They will break it up eventually into carbon dioxide and water. You can also get some methane uh, being produced by material that comes in from outside the atmosphere. You have cosmic dust, you have also meteorites that come in, they contain a lot of organic carbon and that material can also be turned into methane. So there's a couple of potential different sources that could uh, go towards explaining what was going on. Once Mama made his discovery, other people decided to jump into the game as well and, and see if they could see what he was seeing. So other observations really started to come out of the woodwork. There are people who go back through their data and they claim to see it also. So there's other telescopic observers, such as uh, Krasnopolsky. Um, he claims the earliest detection of methane because when he went back into his uh, telescopic data from the 1990s, he can see it there as well. A spacecraft that was around Mars at the time, Mars Express, they happened to have a spectrometer on board that wasn't designed to see methane, but they realized that they could use it in that way. And so they made their own measurements and uh, for Masano, this is the first publication because Mama actually spent some time working on his data, didn't publish till 2009. The Mars Express team, they published in 2004. So technically they're the first to publish. But once these different measurements, they come out of the woodwork, there's a problem that becomes apparent pretty quickly. 
none of those telescopic observations, none of them agree in time, none of them agree in how much methane should be there, and nobody agrees on where it should be seen on the planet. MOMA sees that one release, it's near the equator, near uh, Nili Fosse, the people aboard Mars Express, what they see is an enrichment that takes place at the poles. So this is uh, a bit confusing. And so there are plans that are made to see if the debate can be settled with additional measurements. And so we start thinking about spacecraft that are heading to Mars and whether or not they can help to solve this problem. The primary instrument that addresses this is something called the Sample Analysis at Mars uh, instrument. And this is something that's on board the Curiosity rover. It has a sub piece, a little component uh, called the tunable laser spectrometer. So SAM is basically a microwave size chemistry lab that looks at gases. It uh, can look at soils, all sorts of great stuff. And it's interested in the molecules that are within that. The, the uh, tunable laser spectrometer, that is an instrument that uh, basically takes a laser beam, bounces it back and forth 81 times, and looks at what gases absorb that light um, as it goes back and forth. And it uses that to determine what kinds of gases are there. And it was seen that this could be made sensitive to methane, and so it was. And so once we get to the Martian surface, we started to measure methane using this instrument. Here are the results. Initially, we didn't see very much. So let me walk you through this figure real quick. So down at the bottom, it's the time of year. So this is the spring equinox over here, mark zero. And then we go all the way back around through spring, summer, autumn, and winter to the spring equinox again, right along here. Up on this side, we have how much methane we could see. So this is a time of year versus how much type of plot. And the different years that we've been on Mars, starting with Mars year 31 in uh, this gray color, um, are color coded. So then Mars year 32 is blue, 33 is yellow, and 34 is red. So very early on, we saw almost nothing. It's these little points down here that all cluster around zero. So at first we were very disappointed and a bit surprised, to be honest with you, that we weren't seeing methane. But we kept at it. We kept measuring. And then, right here, towards the end of the year, we see this interesting spike. Very interesting, things are going on. We go on into Mars year 32, so now we're in the blue color coded stuff, and we see an even bigger spike that disappears again. So it's not at the same time of year, not at in quite the same place. It's a little bit confusing, but we're seeing these sorts of spikes that look a little bit like what Momo was seeing with the, the spike that he observed. We saw it once and then it disappeared. And we see a couple of these types of things as well. So it's a similar thing uh, in terms of behavior, but they don't directly confirm or agree or disagree because it's not like Momo was looking at the same time as we were making our own measurements. And that's true for most of the methane measurements. This is something, these types of measurements, they're hard to make. And so they're made very sporadically. And they don't tend to overlap. But it turns out that when we were making these blue observations here, there was another spacecraft that was looking down, and that was the planetary Fourier spectrometer on Mars Express. And they see the same thing at the same time. So that was very exciting. They uh, published this just last year, that they were able to see over Gale these wonderful spikes of methane as well at the same time. And it's about the same concentration too, so we're feeling pretty confident here. We dug into our results more and more over time. So the instrument that we're using to take these measurements, it has two different modes. There's this sort of faster direct ingest mode, we call it, where we just take air directly into the instrument from the atmosphere. And then we look at it with the spectrometer. That's the, the fast way of doing it. Then we have what's called an enrichment mode. And what happens here is we take that air in and we pass it over carbon dioxide scrubbers. The same as that you'd have in say the uh, Apollo command module, for instance, to take the exhalation of the astronauts out of that recycled air. So by taking out the carbon dioxide, which is the greater part of the air on Mars, it concentrates everything else. And it lets you see those things with more sensitivity. This enrichment mode is hard to do, and it takes a lot of time and effort, but it gives you a more precise result. 
you can see the enrichment modes uh, results on this plot here. If you look for the points that don't have these error bars on them, it's because the error bars are so tiny. And it turns out that these measurements, they're low, but they're not zero. If we just filter these out and look at them by themselves, then what we see is that there's this cycle as well, this sort of seasonal cycle that repeats as you go through the seasons. So that means there's two different kinds of behavior here. You have this seasonal cycle, you have these individual pulses or plumes or bursts. The seasonal cycle, I think, is really interesting. And the reason that this is interesting is because, you know, it shouldn't be there unless something is really going on. To give you an example of what a seasonal cycle looks like on the Earth, I've got a plot here um, which follows carbon dioxide. And this is observations that are made from Mauna Loa and Hawaii over the past uh, 50, 60, 70 years. And what you see here, there are two things to point out. One, the concentration of carbon dioxide gets higher and higher and higher with time. That's not terribly surprising because we're putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But you'll notice that the red line actually goes up and down and up and down every year. We can look at a blow up of that right here. And what you're seeing is the carbon dioxide being taken up mostly by the boreal forest. It's being turned into trees and tree material um, in the uh, spring and early summer in the Northern Hemisphere. And because the Southern Hemisphere just doesn't have as much land mass as the North, it shows up as this clear seasonal cycle. Now on Mars, the atmospheric lifetime of, of um, methane is, is actually quite short. Um, but it is long compared to seasonal time scales, so we wouldn't expect there to be a change over the course of the year. We wouldn't expect it to really change much at all. But if you go back to this figure, you see that there's a huge change. It goes from 0.2 up to 0 0.6, 0 0.7. That's a factor of three. It's enormous. That's much bigger than the changes we're even seeing here with carbon dioxide on the Earth. So it's really hard to figure out what's causing that. What, what's going on with that variation? So that's the, the puzzle that we, we sort of had going into this, this interesting couple of years of, of this, uh, this debate. So the second part here, the idea of folly. We have uh, a couple of scientists um, who have decided to take some interesting uh, you know, views of this. Some of them wonder, could everybody be right? Even though none of the methane things seem to you know, agree with one another, could everybody be right somehow? And another opposing view, could everybody be wrong? In some ways that everybody is wrong idea is the simpler one. Um, definitely the simplest thing. It's the least exciting explanation. Methane isn't really there. And the main proponent of this is a scientist by the name of Kevin Zonley. He points out that most measurements are either very near to the detection limits of the methods being used, what I mean by that is that the signal is very noisy. It's very hard to make out exactly what's happening. Or you have to really make a huge correction to the signal that you're getting. You need to really you know, clean it up in the computer and maybe you're just enhancing that noise. And because none of the data sets actually seem to be, uh, you know, make sense in the same framework, maybe we should be a little bit skeptical that we're actually seeing something. The other thing that's worrisome here that he points out um, is that as the measurements get better, as we get better and better instruments, the amount of methane that we see in the atmosphere seems to get less and less, and that's troubling. So interestingly, um, Kevin thinks that everybody's wrong with the exception of TGO, and, and we'll find out why in a little bit of time. That's the new um, orbiter that the uh, Europeans have sent to Mars to specifically look at these trace gases. Now there's other you know, problems potentially with uh, the methane story in that some of the plumes that we've seen look kind of weird and they seem to go away really quickly. That, that four month disappearance that Mama saw doesn't seem to make a lot of sense when you consider that methane on Mars should stick around for 300 years. So maybe everyone's wrong. What about the other side? Maybe everybody's right. So here's a, a different scientist, um, Mark Fries. So he suggested in 2015 that all of the plumes could be right because maybe they correspond to interactions between Mars and the dust trails 
of comets. So this is the same process that gives rise to meteor showers here on the Earth. Maybe there's just a really big meteor shower or an enhancement in a meteor shower, and we see that as a plume. There's lots of carbon-bearing material in these uh, particles that make up these meteor showers. Maybe we're just seeing methane produced from them. So in order for this to be right, you've got to have that material, that dust, input into the atmosphere at just the right time. And you have to turn that carbon in the dust into methane really, really quickly. You also need the hydrogen source as well, because there's not a lot of hydrogen in this material. But we'll leave that aside. And then once you've created the methane in the upper atmosphere, you need to get rid of it really darn quick. Um, so if all of that is true, then we're good. Now, after this paper came out, other scientists took a look at each one of the components of this. So inputs of cosmic dust at the right time, well, when you actually increase the number of different comets that you track and the interactions that you expect to have, uh, it turns out that the list doesn't seem to make as much sense anymore. So we'll have to cross that one out. Secondly, uh, I've taken a look at how quickly you can turn carbon into methane. And it takes time, it takes years. You can't really do it in, in, in days to weeks or even months. So unfortunately, we have to cross that one out too. And the last one, uh, this seems to be a bit of a misunderstanding perhaps because it's actually the photochemistry, the sun destroying methane in the upper atmosphere that sets that 300 year limit. And so it's hard to get rid of methane faster than 300 years. So as a result, it does not look like everybody is right, or at least this mechanism is correct. But you know, Mark brings up a very interesting point. It's actually very surprising that we don't see more methane in the Martian atmosphere. And the reason for that is that 240 tons of organic carbon falls on Mars each year, and that stuff's got to go somewhere, and we don't know where. When we take that kind of material and we put it in the lab, what happens is that it emits methane like there's no tomorrow. So it seems like this material should be doing that kind of thing. And our models suggest that if this type of material was actually you know, being converted to methane, then enough background would be created for us to see it. Now, the concentration shouldn't evolve over time. This doesn't say anything about plumes, doesn't say anything about that seasonal cycle, but it does tell us that there must be something about the chemistry, something that we don't understand, a mystery on Mars that we have yet to solve. And by the way, if you've not seen these interplanetary dust particles, we've had a few collection me mechanisms. They're these wonderful little uh, bits of material, only a few microns in size, little tiny grains glued together with this sort of carbon-rich material. And we can look at this stuff in the lab. So stranger and stranger. It's enough to make you just want to throw up your hands and say, Maybe the stuff's not there at all. Maybe, maybe we're all worried about nothing. Is methane just a figment of our own imagination? And there are two sophisticated measurements that have been made that have been designed specifically to address this problem, and they disagree with one another. So that, that really in the past year has made people wonder, you know, what, what do we even know what's going on here? So... That is because of a spacecraft by the name of the Trace Gas Orbiter, TGO. So the Trace Gas Orbiter was designed, as its name implies, to study trace gases in the Martian atmosphere and to study them with very, very high precision, much more than Curiosity can do, way more than the telescopes on the Earth can do. This spacecraft was going to put this mystery to bed. So what do they see when it comes to methane? The short answer, nothing, nothing at all. Now, there are some uh, limitations on where they can see methane that we'll get into in a minute, but at least in the part of the atmosphere they can observe, which means anything above five kilometers, they're not seeing anything down to uh, a limit of you know, 0.05 parts per billion by volume. That's way less than MUMMA's 45 parts per billion. That's way less even than Curiosity's you know, 0.2 to 0.7 uh, parts per billion by volume. So there are some people who think there's gotta be something wrong with this measurement. You know, they're, they're not seeing anything. How can that possibly be? Um, but myself, I, I believe the TGO result. I, I think that's real. 
And I think it provides an excellent constraint on the Martian atmosphere. It's telling us something important about what's going on with the cycle of methane on Mars. And again, when you think about it, the team creating this, the TGO team, just like the MSL Curiosity people, they're you know a highly competent team. They're very well motivated to get this right. And they put a lot of time and effort into getting this right. So I've taken what uh, my colleagues like to refer to as the Canadian approach to this, which is to say, what if they're both right? What if the Americans are right and the Europeans are right? Could there be an, uh, a universe, a Mars, in which this actually is true? So how could they be correct? Well, it turns out the timing and the context of those measurements, that's the critical part. So the Trace Gas Orbiter, it's in orbit. It's observing very large volumes of atmosphere. It looks at the sun through the limb, like that very first picture I showed from the ISS of what a transit looks like up close. That's exactly what they're doing. They're looking very far from the surface, above three kilometers always, usually above five kilometers. And they always look at the same time of day. They look near sunset or sunrise. They need that point where the sun is just creeping over the horizon. By contrast, the SAM and tunable laser spectrometer on Curiosity it's looking at a very small volume of atmosphere, just whatever it can pump in through its, uh, its inlet. It's very close to the surface. It's sitting on the rover. So you're talking about something that's just a meter off the ground. And it's doing this in the middle of the night, every time in the middle of the night. And it turns out that is the key piece of information here. It's that timing that's really critical. And the reason for that is that at night, atmospheric mixing is really inhibited near the surface. That kind of thing that's being driven by uh, the sun heating the ground, that just goes away once the sun goes away. Let me tell you a little bit about that. We've got this thing we call the planetary boundary layer. It's the part of the atmosphere near the surface where all of this mixing takes place. So when the sun comes out in the morning, it warms that surface, that causes convection to start going, that causes that mixing. And as the day goes on, that mixed layer gets deeper and deeper, which is to say that it gets thicker and thicker, rising to a higher and higher altitude. And you can see that here as this mixed layer, that white zone, gets higher and higher here. Now, overnight, the sun goes away. So that mixing slows considerably. It doesn't go to zero. As many of us who do uh, telescopic observing know, stars still do twinkle at night. It's not completely still. And those people who grow grapes to make wine, you often see them setting fires in their fields to keep the grapes warm. It's not the fire itself that is keeping the grapes warm. What it's doing is it's starting up that same mixing cycle and it's bringing the warm air that's trapped well above the grapes back down to the surface to mix it. But near the surface where it's coldest, and on Mars and Curiosity, we don't have any fires that we can set to make the mixing go, things get really, really stable. And you can trap things in this really stable area, this bubble that opens up at night. So if we think about it in terms of, you know, starting in the middle of the day, going all the way through the night and back to the next morning, and we combine this with the idea that there is something going on underneath the surface, Maybe it's our cow here, maybe it's some other process, uh, creating methane and that methane seeps into the atmosphere. During the day, when mixing is really vigorous, so the planetary boundary layer is very deep, it's very thick, all of that methane gets diluted amongst a really big amount of air. But at night, when things are really calm and really quiet, that uh, methane has nowhere to go, it's trapped, and so it builds up. So in the day, if you look at this gold line here, we see basically no methane. And then suddenly, once that uh, mixing goes away and that little bubble gets created, then the methane concentration seems to spike up. In the morning, the sun comes out again, that gets mixed back up, and the methane levels fall. So if you're looking at the surface in this bubble, in the middle of the night, as Curiosity is, that's when you see big pulses of methane. But if you're looking either at sunset or sunrise, when TGO is looking, you don't see much at all. And this stuff never makes it up high enough in the atmosphere to be seen. 
we can uh, do a sophisticated computer model of this. And it turns out that that seasonal cycle I showed you actually matches the prediction of material coming out from the interior. So all that I want to point out here is that the red and the, the black, they follow the same pattern. They go with each other. So there you go. The model um, agrees with the measurements. So of course, this means that the mystery is solved. Unfortunately, it doesn't. This says something about what's going on in the background and gives you a reason why you might see that seasonal cycle. It, it doesn't need anything more fancy than our own understanding of Mars right now. But the plumes, those are hard to deal with. Um, it's that 300 year lifetime again. Once you put this stuff in the atmosphere, it takes a long time for it to go away. If you only put a little tiny bit in, and that's what you're seeing here, this sort of simulation, I will start it from the start again. So here we are emitting a little bit of methane, and this is how the air sort of, you know, pushes it around. The red colors are concentrated, the blue colors are less concentrated. And over the course of a day, which is how long this runs, you can see that material just being dispersed everywhere and being diluted away. So that works for MSL, for curiosity. Doesn't work so well for the plumes that Mama sees because they're global. There's nowhere for them to go and get diluted to. The other problem that we have here with plumes is that the plumes that we see, they're all isolated high measurements. We take a snapshot because these measurements are hard to make and we see, oh look, the concentration is very high. We never see it come up, we never see it go down. And that makes it hard to tell why it was high. Is another good question, how high is high? So for instance, in trying to gather the data for the model that I just showed you, uh, we took a few measurements and what we saw was the highest plume of methane we've ever seen uh, at the Curiosity landing site. We were very excited by that. It wasn't what we were trying to do, but it was very interesting. So we decided to set up a, a measurement as quickly as possible thereafter. Maybe we could see this thing decaying away. And two days later was the earliest we could do it again. When we took that measurement, we saw nothing. So it was already gone, whatever happened. That is what causes the difficulty with figuring out this problem. So really, what could be happening? I mean, you've got to get rid of this stuff fast. And we have other pieces to the puzzle that are falling in that are equally confusing. So methane is a very trace gas in the Martian atmosphere. There's very little of it. We're talking about one part in a billion, right? but oxygen is the fourth largest gas in the Martian atmosphere. And it seems to go through the same kind of weird cycling. So that is very difficult to understand. What could be happening here? There's gotta be a piece of the puzzle we're missing. That piece of the puzzle could be something like, um, that's something, there's some interesting chemistry that happens right near the surface. And since oxygen's doing weird stuff, maybe it's oxygen and methane doing something together or whatever's happened to oxygen is also happening to methane. That's a little weird from a chemical point of view, but who knows, maybe it's something like that. Some groups have suggested that the methane gets stuck to the dust particles. We've definitely got a lot of dust in the Martian atmosphere. Maybe the methane gets stuck to those particles really quickly and they don't uh, actually, doesn't get released back into the gas phase where we can look at it. My personal favorite is this idea of triboelectric low discharge. On Mars, you have such a thin atmosphere that instead of lightning, when you get charges separating, it actually causes the uh, place where that charge separation occurs to glow. So for instance, when you try to create a lightning bolt in a Mars chamber, you get something that looks like this. And it turns out that moving sand grains are really good at separating charges. Just like when you rub a rubber rod, for instance, you can uh, create a charge separation. So these sand grains rubbing against each other do the same thing. So maybe it's these uh, discharges that are actually changing things. And a more disquieting possibility um, by some measurements that have been made recently, it turns out there's a bit of an overlap between ozone and methane in the techniques that we use to try to measure methane. So maybe there's no methane at all. And what we're seeing are changes in ozone. So where do we go from here? <laughs> well, what we really need are more measurements. It's going to be that that tells us whether or not we have, you know, what are the processes that are important for creating methane and destroying methane. 
do we have a biotic type of process, something caused by life? Do we have something else going on here? So that's really what we need. So how do we get that? Well, let me share with you an anecdote from the ninth Mars conference that took place last year. This is a presentation given by Kevin Zonlay. And um, he was of the opinion that there is no methane to worry about. And he ended his presentation this way. He said um, you know, that this is something that we should tro stop trying to possess. We should leave it to Frodo because Gandalf will protect him. And I thought that was a fantastic way for him to end because I've actually been working on an instrument called a mage. So I guess I have dibs on Gandalf there. And what it does is the same thing that Curiosity's TLS does, but it uses a more modern spectrometer, which is 10,000 times as sensitive. That lets us measure methane all the time through the day, all the time through the night. We don't need to do the enrichment. We don't need to, to do the things that make it hard to measure methane on Mars right now. So this is something that would let us see how things come up, how things come down, and would tell us if we're looking at methane or if we're looking at ozone. So this could, uh, could help us. And uh, this is something that uh, the Canadian Space Agency has funded us to take a, a deeper look into over the next couple of years. And this is a, a wonderful little thing in Canada. We, we develop and we build these types of spectrometers. They're used to go and find leaks in pipelines or people who've been cheating on their methane emissions. And you can fly these things on, on drones. They're really lovely, compact little things. Great for flying into space as well. So where does this all go? What's the, the future of methane on Mars? Well, TGO, they're gonna keep making observations from orbit. Mars Science Lab, Curiosity, we're gonna keep making observations from the surface. We're gonna keep refining what we know, but there are fundamental limitations to these things and further observations are unlikely. So the 2020 Mars rover Perseverance, it doesn't have the sensor capable of uh, measuring methane in this way. And the Rosalind Franklin rover, ExoMars, it doesn't have a sensor either. So the two new rovers that will be landing uh, have no way of looking at this, unfortunately. So we're gonna keep developing our models trying to look at the few data points we have, and it really is very small. I mean, about 14 individual measurements over eight years. And we're gonna keep trying out things in the lab to continue investigating potential solutions to this mystery. But as, uh, as Carl Sagan has said, sometimes in science, we just need to love the mysteries themselves. So with that, thank you very much for having me come and speak to you today. And I'd be more than happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. We're going to head now to Ennio Cellucci for questions from our YouTube audience. Ennio? Thank you, Denise. Our first question this evening is from Blake and Carol. And his question is, the United Arab Emirates probe is going to measure the atmosphere of Mars. Will they be looking for methane as well? So I don't know if the, the HOPE orbiter um, will be looking for methane specifically. It would have a very hard time seeing this type of concentration. It's not optimized in quite the same way that uh, the instruments aboard TGO are optimized. So it's, it's unlikely to see anything, unfortunately. Chris Fon is asking, uh, what about China's lander? To my knowledge, they, they don't have a, an instrument for this. Uh, either. So this is something, and, and the, the reason for this is because we had TGO and TGO was expected to solve this problem. And so for the other agencies, they are looking for different problems to solve because they thought that this was going to be old news by the time that they launched. It's not easy to, to change a spacecraft and the types of instruments, what they measure and how they do it um, very close to a launch. And I mean, by very close, I mean within a few years uh, of time. And so these, um, these spacecraft were not optimized for this problem. Chris Bond is asking, would methane have time to be frozen into the cap and can it be released with seasonal heating? So part of the way that the release works is with seasonal heating. So um, the models that we run imagine methane being generated or being released in the deep subsurface 
and then it tries to make its way up. But as it makes its way up through the subsurface, it can get stuck for a period of time uh, through a process we call adsorption, so getting stuck on the surface of this rock and that rock, this bit of soil, that bit of soil. And so it sort of pinballs its way up over time. When the ground is warmer, that pinballing happens faster. So the thermal side of it is very important. Cool. That's Briggs is asking, please tell us more about Martian St. Elmo's fire. Ah, yes. Um, so there's a few groups who look at this. There, there's a Danish group that simulates this in the lab in, in little tiny containers where they put uh, a Mars atmosphere or the same gas as you'd find in the Mars atmosphere along with different uh, kinds of dust and, and soil and sand and they, they shake it up and you can actually see those containers glow. There are other groups, uh, primarily in Washington state, uh, who are looking at what kinds of chemical changes that they can do to rocks. So they're not sort of thinking of how it changes the atmosphere, they're thinking how it changes the rock itself to just be, you know, sort of pummeled by this, uh, this tribal electric discharge or St. Elmo's fire, as you say, um, it, it continuously. Um, all this happens because the, uh, the breakdown voltage in the Martian atmosphere is very low compared to the Earth. And so that's why you sort of get all of these pathways going at once to get this glow. Another question from Blake, which plants in the solar system have high concentrations of methane other than Mars? So the highest that I can think of is Titan. Uh, but Titan's interesting because the temperature is so cold there. It's uh, 94 degrees Kelvin on Titan, almost everywhere and almost all the time within a couple of, uh, of degrees. And there, methane can be 5% of the atmosphere. But because it's so cold, essentially methane behaves the way that water does here on the Earth. And so you get methane clouds and streams and lakes and oceans uh, moving around. It doesn't tend to get, um, it, it doesn't tend to have quite the same processes. It still gets busted up in the upper atmosphere by solar photons, uh, which is why we know there has to be a resupply of methane on, on Titan. But it, it has, sort it behaves in a different role than it does uh, on Mars. Betty is asking, if not methane, what other gases are important to the atmosphere of Mars? Ah, so the, the three biggest are going to be carbon dioxide. That's usually about 96% of the atmosphere. Then you've got uh, nitrogen and argon. Those are about 2% each, between 1% or 2%. They change a little bit with the seasons because the carbon dioxide can condense out on the polar cap. It gets cold enough that you can actually turn it into dry ice. And that means that the, the things that you aren't condensing out into ice, those can um, increase in concentration. And we learned something about mixing in the Martian atmosphere that's really neat from watching the levels of argon and nitrogen uh, go up. Uh, nitrogen's a compound that doesn't actually easily incorporate into, uh, in, into rocks. And so that's why it's still around. It's a fairly abundant element in the uh, sort of in, in, in the universe generally as these things go. Argon is actually emitted by a decay process uh, that happens in a lot of terrestrial planets. So it's something that has come up over time. Uh, after that, you move to very trace gases. Oxygen is the biggest of those, but there are many other combinations of these, uh, these types of, uh, of elements into different molecules at very low concentration. And a final question is for me. With the project that you're working on, um, what major assumptions are required to move from uh, Earth usage to Mars usage? So I gather the electronics need to be space rated, but what else is necessary that's inobvious, especially chemically speaking? Oh, I see. What changes would be required to an instrument to measure on Mars as opposed to the Earth? Yes, please. All right, so uh, you're, you're absolutely right about the electronics. Uh, you, you definitely don't want to have that, that St. Elmo's fire going on inside of your, your circuit boards. That, that's very important. And it's something that we have learned how to do pretty good with, with spacecraft now. The um, instrument that I'm working on, it is happiest at about um, something, a range that's about say, uh, one tenth to one sixth of the pressure that you'd see 
uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. So when you operate it on Earth, you actually pump it down to a lower concentration. On Mars, we would have to pump it up. So Mars's atmosphere is more like, um, you know, 0.6% as dense as the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere is. So you'd have to, you know, pump that up by about, you know, 10 or 20 times. So you're talking about a positive pump instead of a negative pump going on there. Inst other than that, things are actually pretty simple. These new spectrometers, they don't require very, very fine alignment. So they're not bothered by the changes in temperature that happen as you move from the Earth to Mars. And especially on Mars as you move from day to night because it changes uh, temperature by 100 degrees Celsius as you go from day uh, into night. So it's, uh, it's a little crazy that way. Um, but it's, it's a pretty robust piece of equipment we're finding as we're going through. And so the idea in the next few years is we're going to put it through its paces and uh, see what it'll take. Thank you. And I think that's all the questions we have now. Oh, uh, there was one question that literally just came up. Oh, is there oil on Mars? Is there oil on Mars? Yes. Oh, wouldn't that be interesting? So it doesn't look like Mars had the time to create the kinds of conditions that would be required to get oil deposits uh, like we see them on the Earth. Most of the oil deposits come from macroscopic life, which means that they've been created in the last 500 to 550 million years since the Cambrian explosion. Um, Mars was only habitable for a short time, so it likely did not have that kind of, a, of an abundant biosphere, which is not to say that it should be zero. Um, if Mars was ever an inhabited place, and the more we learn about ancient Mars, the more habitable it is, we don't know if anything was ever there. Then that material, you know, could be under the surface, it could be decomposing. Certainly the, um, the uh, cosmic dust, the organic carbon in that could be buried as well. Uh, over time, the same way as these sorts of things get buried by sed sediment here in the Earth. Certainly at Gale, if we had a lake there, and which looks very much like we did, uh, then that material could fall into the lake, not get converted by the ultraviolet radiation into you know, water and carbon dioxide, settles at the bottom of the lake, and then be covered up with lake sediments. And then over time, the heat breaks that material down. And so maybe you could get something that way, but uh, yeah, likely uh, no, uh, no oil deposits, nothing economically viable, certainly. Thank you, Dr. Denise, I think that's all the questions we have this evening. Thank you, Ennio. Uh, on behalf of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre and the RASC DDO Committee, I'd like to thank Dr. John Morse for sharing all of this cutting edge research with us. Thanks also to our technical support team, Andrew Reed, Betty Reed, and Blake Nankaro. Thanks especially to Ennio Chalucci for fielding questions from our YouTube audience, and also to our coordinator, Celia Du, for organizing this event. Finally, a special thank you to all our viewers for joining us this evening and for your questions. This talk is part of a series of lecture nights at the David Dunlap Observatory Online, offered through the partnership of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Toronto Centre, and the City of Richmond Hill. For a complete schedule of RASC events, please visit us online at rasc.to.ca. Our lecture series will be on pause for the month of September, as several of our members take a well-deserved holiday. Our next lecture a lecture night at the DDO online is scheduled for October 3rd and will feature a panel on promoting diversity and inclusion in astronomy. We are excited to have a very special lineup of guests for that event. We'll see you back here for the live stream of that panel. Until then, wishing you all crisp, clear nights for some end of summer observing.